Hello, hello. Welcome to my channel. My name is Sophie. I'm recording this from the future uh, or the present or something as an introduction to a couple of different weeks of footage. This is a vlog that I started towards the beginning of October and uh, am just wrapping up today on the 31st, so it's wide ranging. In it, I'm trying to finish up some books that have been lingering on my currently reading pile, uh, trying to be a little bit more enthusiastic about my reading, getting out of the slump, and be a little, a little bit more systematic. So stay tuned to see how I did. Bibliosophie. I'm in a bit of a slump right now. I'm not extremely enthusiastic about the books I've been reading and kind of not sure what books to read next. So I do have a couple of plans. I want to give myself a bit of a tabula rasa of my current reads. I, if you know me, uh, you know that I read a bunch of books at once and I feel that sometimes it's good for me. It keeps me pliable and makes me read a lot and it's just how I like to do things but it, I think it also keeps me rather unfocused sometimes and this is one of those times. So I would like to zero out my currently reading list. Uh, some of them have been on there for a while. I did at the beginning of this month finish two books that I've been working on for a really really long time or rather kind of not working on because that's what happens. Some books just kind of get dwindly. So I am happy that I did finish um, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us by Hanif Abdurraqib, uh, which is a series of essays I started all the way back in May. They're great. I read almost all of it in May in fact uh, and beginning of June and then I just never quite finished it so I did at the beginning of the month. I also finally finished Doris Lessing's um, The Golden Notebook, which has been a long-term project. So that took care of a couple of things that had been kind of festering in my currently reading list. I have four more. Babel by R.F. Kuang, I've mentioned uh, in my previous vlog. I wasn't sure if I was going to continue reading it because I wasn't supremely enthusiastic about it. I did start picking it up again last week, read another major chunk of it. Still not actually perfectly enthusiastic about it. I have once again lulled and kind of don't want to finish it, but I have read about 80% of it now. So I, again, if you know me, uh, you know that I don't feel an obligation to finish books if I don't like them. This one I feel a little bit more of an obligation for various reasons. I'm not entirely sure why. One of them is the sunk cost fallacy. It is a long book and since I've read so much of it I kind of want to finish it. Another reason is because I kind of don't like it that much, and yet a lot of people really, really do, I feel like I should finish it so that I can have kind of a formal opinion of it. Um, I don't think my opinion will change, but I feel like I need to, I owe it to the book and to other people maybe or something um, to have a full opinion of the full book something like that. And then the other reason is a perfectly good one, which is that I do enjoy it to, to some extent. So it's not like it's a miserable experience by any stretch of the imagination. But I do think that my desire to finish is a little bit more rooted in negatives, or at least not outright positives, than not. I am also reading uh, Mae Sarton's uh, Journal of a Solitude, and also it hasn't really been hitting so much, with the exception of actually this afternoon. I am listening to this on audiobook, and I mentioned also in a previous video that I wasn't really getting on with it super super well. This is another book that a lot of people like, and that I feel like I should like, uh, that it's supposed to really 
be the kind of book that I go crazy for, and I haven't been able to. The alchemy hasn't been right. This afternoon I was uh, walking between a uh, class and a rehearsal, and I was actually liking it a lot more. So maybe I've finally found the rhythm of it. I'm pretty close to done with it actually because it is pretty short. Um, so I suspect I'm going to finish that one and ideally I'll be a little bit more enthusiastic about it. And I have two physical books uh, that I've started. I started The Fawn by Magda Zabo last week. You're not going to believe it. I also am not really getting on that enthusiastically with this. Um, I love Magda Zabo. I have loved three other books of hers that I've read. This one is very good. It's very Zabo-ish, so I think it's more on me than it is on it. Um, I need to sit down and actually read it. I think it is also probably suffering from being kind of left aside a little bit. I read about a third of it in quite a focused way last weekend, and I served the book better that way. Uh, so I think this is my first order of business for the week to really just sit down, read this book. And finally, a book that's been in process for mm, several months now, a couple months since July is The Biography of Clarice Lispector by Benjamin Moser. Um, again, love Clarice Lispector. This is an interesting biography. Uh, that I think is really good for my Lispector project this year of reading a lot of her works and I'm enjoying reading about her life, uh, which informs her works. But uh, while I was really enjoying it in July, I sort of set it aside and I should start it up again. So that is also a goal. I'd like to be more focused. I'd like to be more enthusiastic. Um, We'll see if I can manage that. So I'm hoping that vlogging will kind of help to jumpstart me into a slightly more focused reading state. It tends to do so. Let's go on this adventure. Hansel and Gretel? Mm. No one? Dissolve. Mm -hmm. Is it good? Okay, before I head off into my evening, Let's talk Magda. I am liking this book a lot more. I, it is finally coalescing for me. It's starting to really hit. I am about two thirds of the way through, a little bit more. And the, the picture of it is emerging more. It is very much a Magda Zabo situation. Uh, we are following Esther who is an actress um, and in Hungary. Uh, and she basically is giving us a long form monologue of her life up to this point. Her kind of miserable childhood, the things that have made her, her grievances, her hurts, her successes, her faults and a lot of those faults are emerging uh, in a very Magda Zabo sort of way. Our main character is deeply, deeply flawed. She is unsympathetic in many ways and kind of increasingly so. She's bitter. She is pugnacious and kind of unpleasant in some ways, but she's also very sympathetic. You, you get to understand some of her actions, inactions, misdemeanors, misdeeds. I'm really, really interested in the narrative of it. Um, it's a confusing narrative, uh, again, in a very Zabo sort of way, because she's flitting through time a lot. She's in the present tense, and she is telling us about her childhood, about growing up, and 
uh, her young adulthood, everything up to this point, but she's kind of flitting in and out of discourses. She's also addressing you, a somewhat mysterious you, a lover, and we don't really know why, how. There are a lot of things that are unclear, and this is very much what was happening in the door in um, Cataline Street, slightly less in Abigail, but still there's a lot of lack of full knowledge of what is going on. Uh, we are we are being withheld some information. Um, but as I was starting to say kind of before I got into a tangent on lack of information, not completely, it is part of the narrative. I love the fact that she is an actress and this really, really feels like a performance of a dialogue. Uh, one of the things which Zabo um, is really concerned with in her work is telling stories and um, the the narrative shifts in stories and how how we narrativize our personal histories as well as and and how they interact with the larger cataclysms of history. Uh, and so it feels really significant that this is an actress who is in um, living, who has lived through Nazi occupation, uh, is now in post-World War II, um, very censorship heavy regime where she's also being watched. And so there, there is a lot of what can and cannot be said. And so this feels like a certain admission of who she is, uh, her trying to um, ascertain even who she is and also prove to us, to, to concretize to us who and what she is. So I love the, the narrative impact of how the book is written um, in terms of how it uh, dovetails, that's it, with also its themes. Um, yeah, so obviously the book is starting to uh, percolate in my head a lot more than it was. It's still not going to be my favorite Zombo, but it's hitting, I'm happy to say. All right, that's my, that's my Magda update. Catch you in the next uh, little talking head segment. Ciao. since I talked to camera, or at least very long time in the context of a vlog. I have not sat down to talk about books for this vlog in almost two weeks, and I haven't even filmed footage for vlog purposes, I think, in about a week and a half. So it's, for me, that's a very, very long time. I am somebody who perceives time as long, and I've remained sort of very childish in thinking that time is very long. Days are very long, weeks are very long, and it has felt truly like an eternity. I have just not had really the courage to film myself. I don't know if I desperately have the courage to film myself right now. Um, I've been going through my own kind of mental headaches. I've been having a hard time. 
I want to talk about the books that I did finish a while ago, in fact. I haven't really been reading very much um, for all of the above. I haven't been sleeping at all, uh, and that isn't helping anything. I did finish Journal of a Solitude by Mae Sarton, and uh, I initially said that I wasn't really liking it. Then I said, oh, you know what? Actually, I listened to about 30 minutes of it and I really liked it. Ultimately, I didn't end up loving it. Um, it was fine. I, I had wanted it to be this wonderful gem of a book that's made perfectly for me, basically, because it should have been. It's a writer's journal in which she's considering her creative process and her solitude in various facets, being a woman, but it felt, it kind of left me cold. It felt too, too distant an experience for me. I've been trying to, for a couple of weeks now, figure out why. And there are some just kind of basic, this is a woman from a different time and place to a certain extent. So there are just sort of some political things that I don't align with, but actually generally most of it ages pretty well. This is from, I think, 1973. Um, but most of her takes on a lot of things are fine you know a little a little gender essentialist um but kind of are okay i think part of the problem is that solitude and especially loneliness which is not the same as solitude but which for me often is the same um these things are such personal things uh, for obvious reasons. They, they have such a shape that is linked to your own experience and your own overthinking of things, certainly for me, that I think I'm more allergic to the shape of somebody else's solitude because I've really internalized that no, no, this is not how overthinking works. That's not how my overthinking works, particularly. Uh, this is not how melancholy works. My melancholy has a slightly different flavor. So I think there is also just an innate, um, non-compatible quotient because I expect something that's maybe too specific and too specifically catered to me. Um, yeah, and she's a little too um, spiritual. I think she's too Christian for me. And it's not a very Christian book at all, but just her her sense of cosmicness is more Christian, in my opinion, than mine. Um, so they're just these little things that um, kind of constantly kept me at a distance. So read it. I understand why a lot of people like it. Ultimately, it wasn't for me. I wasn't really on that train. Otherwise, I read, I finished Babel. And one of the reasons I haven't wanted to talk on camera is actually just because I haven't had the courage to talk about this book on, on so many levels. I don't wanna try to concisely tell the story of it, and I don't really wanna concisely say what I think about it and what it's doing, but I'm gonna try. So at basis, I didn't really like this book. And in some ways I really didn't like it, in fact. Uh, but also I understand that it is well liked and also why it is well liked. And I also, to be fair, understand that a lot of the things I don't like about it are because it's not written for me and they're not bad at all. This is a long book, which in some ways I think is what is an appeal. Um, it is not really off-putting to me, but I think it part of its length is due to some redundancy. 
and is also very much by design because it takes place in the 1830s. It is written to be a sort of Victorian novel, but of course from a modern lens. Um, it's not just a, an alternate history uh, novel, it also has just a little bit of fantasy in it. Um, we are following four students at Oxford in the 1830s who are part of a prestigious translation program called Babel in which they are using kind of the inherent power of words to do magic, uh, to do a specific kind of magic called silver working in which they kind of um, use the the slight differences and sometimes really large differences uh, between a word in one language and its translation into another language and the imperfect ways in which those two same words overlap necessarily uh, between languages creates a kind a powerful force and that's kind of all I'll say about that. I love that conceit. That's really interesting. The f actually, the fantasy aspect of it uh, is not at all what put me off. Uh, I'm not a fantasy reader, but I don't think any person who is not a fantasy reader, who typically does not gravitate towards fantasy, would be put off by the fantasy elements of this. Uh, they are very, very minimal, and they are. it's definitely not hard fantasy. Uh, it's very interesting. As you know, I do love words, I love translation, I love the impossibility of translation, and so forming a whole system and kind of magic system on that uh, is really, really interesting. So there are many things about this book that appealed to me and also, you know, did keep me reading. It is a book about colonialism. Um, and abuse and extractivism. Extractivism in language and of course in resources because uh, our four students are um, other in one way or another uh, as compared to the basic proper Oxford um, British boy. Um, three of them are not white and one of them is white but is a woman. And so they are kind of, you know, the weirdos of Oxford at the time. Um, and they go on a journey facing that, basically. Um, it has some very interesting things to say about colonialism and decolonialization and the uh, complicity of at all, at so many levels, of so many different people, in so many different ways. Uh, one of the things that I think it does actually very well and interestingly is portraying the, the rampant and um, complicated levels of complicity in a racist and colonialist system by different people in different ways. The ways in which different people uh, evolve and also show themselves to be more or less evil and in what ways, how difficult it is to cut ties with a structure that you know is destructive not just to other people, but even to you. Our main character, uh, we've, we have a little bit of shifts of perspective, but we mostly follow Robin, um, and he has a really hard time disentangling himself from the bits of privileges that he has been allowed. Um, so it's a, it's a very good portrayal of the sweet honey of privilege, of uh, breaking into a system and how much that tends to make people complicit because once you've broken into a system that would seek to keep you out or destroy you, you buy into it to a certain extent and it's very very hard to disentangle yourself from that. It's also hard to disentangle yourself from personal relationships to people. I think it is written a little too redundantly for me. 
too simplistically. Um, there are a lot of scenes that just don't need as much explanation. A lot of um, scenes of minor, major, overt, implicit racism um, and misogyny or sexism that I just don't need painted quite so bluntly. There, There's just a lot of, and then this is how he felt because he felt like an outsider for these reasons kind of writing, which felt really kind of stodgy and unnecessary. While the length of the book is definitely by design to make it, you know, sort of Victorian, I think to me, it actually, all of the kind of Victorian trappings of it made me realize just how much it is not a Victorian book. And it was, it, it never tries to be, it, it doesn't try to be written as if it were written by Dickens, but there is this sort of disconnect that happens that makes it less interesting to me wherein but that's also because i don't read historical novels so and that's one of the disconnects i have i don't like a modern voice writing about a historical period all that much um if that's not a problem for you and many many people like historical novels then that's not going to be a disconnect but to me it was this constant disconnect of descriptions it's not even just people wouldn't act that way i don't really really care about how people would or would not act um i think in some ways they wouldn't i think they would not phrase things necessarily the way things are phrased in the book i don't really care but just descriptions of time and place and clothing and just the various little actions felt at odds with the time period because to me the time period gets written about in a specific way and so as i said that's that's on me uh this feels too close to ya for me part of it is because i think the writing is too simplistic but also because it's following young people there is kind of inherently the fact that you're following a kind of tween and but especially teenager um it it feels too much like uh young adult fiction to me because we're following a bunch of young people so again that's kind of not even the book's fault but it's it's hard it's a coming of age um it's a de development and coming of age novel and that sometimes took me out of it because I actually love a coming of age novel, but in a school situation like this, it, I don't know, it felt too YA-ish for me. Maybe because of the fantasy elements, I think it just kind of gave me 2010s YA um, and kind of brought me back. Um, and actually sort of related to that, speaking of school, The Dark Academia aspect of it i think is very appealing to people obviously that is it's such it's it's a, its own little pocket of the internet and especially of the book internet i think kuang uses it interestingly or i don't know if it was on purpose but i think it was on purpose as a very interesting take on the complicity of dark academia i think it's a pretty good dissection of what is it that we like about cozy dark academia why why is it that we love this kind of cozy structure um because she loves it or seems to from an authorial perspective her characters love it they are in love with being at oxford for good reasons they they just but that also becomes a a mo motivating factor in some of their internal complications and complicities because they like to hang out having some tea and scones and talking about books it's 
it's the magic that we all love, right? That's why we joined BookTube. Uh, it's the kind of stereotypical thing that we're looking for. Um, but it comes with its own price tag and it's not uncomplicated because that level of cozy comfort is part academia is something that appeals to me is something I'm part of, but it has, it has its evils and the coziness of it kind of masks the, the realities of, um, what research can be, uh, what just knowledge, what owning knowledge can actually mean. So I think it was by design, but it also meant that I had to be in that world and I just was uncomfortable with it, with this kind of cozy sweater, dark academia. It made me bored. I, I realized that I'm bored with dark academia, actually. Um, I think maybe I've just moved past it or maybe I was just never a fan of it, but it kind of was a, a moment for me of realizing, oh, no, this just isn't for me. That coziness is not, is not what I want. So anyway, those are my complicated thoughts on a book that a lot of people like. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it feels extremely complicated to think about this book, which is very interesting. I'm, I'm glad I read it actually just so that I can try to force myself to articulate in a, in as fair a way as I can, the things that really aren't hitting for me. I come to you later from the same day. I'm apparently on a roll talking about stuff. I wanted to have add, excuse me, one more note about Babel, which is I think that it's rather convenient and facile to set it in the British Empire in Victorian England. I think it's a pretty uncontroversial thing to call out the British Empire. Um, so it makes sense, but also I do think that it's a little bit of an easy, easy way out to a certain extent if you're going to be talking about colonial powers and their effects. Um, otherwise, I want to mention very quickly two books I've been reading, or rather haven't been reading because I just have not been reading at all. Uh, two weeks ago I borrowed from a friend Brian Dillon's Affinities and have gotten part of the way through it, really like it, a series of essays about art, especially photography, and just his looking at art and having affinities to it, essentially. Very much my style. I should finish it. And also, I finally started Paradise Rot by Yannick Val um, over a week ago, and um, I've read about half of it. It's a very fast read. I read it in a sitting and a half, the first half that I did read, and I should finish it. So maybe tonight, in fact, in between things, I shall do so. I should get back to reading. So I did not finish Paradise Rot uh, last night. Perhaps I will finish it tonight in between rehearsal that starts in a few minutes and my gig. Um, I'm really enjoying the like very multi-sensory sensuality of it. Uh, it's pretty grody, but at the same time very alluring, which I already knew about it. Uh, if you have not read it, I recommend uh, Elvia Wilkes' Death by Landscape collection, which I already have talked about a lot on this channel because I really loved it when I read it this summer, but she talks about Paradise Rot also and the, the kind of biological um, tropes in it and is really very much a rot landscape of fungus and the way that fungus acts as symbiotic relationships and just kind of like growing in things. So that serves as a really interesting and uh, fruitful um, landscape for this, this story between two women uh, who are living in an abandoned factory, basically. And this, it's a kind of a coming of age uh, book. It's great. It's really fun. And God damn it, I should read it. I should finally finish it. I'm having a hard time concentrating on reading.
I think it is time to wrap it up. It is right now the 31st of October, so this has been going on for long enough. I am gonna close out this video. Uh, what are the, the major takeaways? Well, I did finish a bunch of books that I had been kind of letting to rot, so that's good. And I've never mentioned it, I think, in previous footage, but I did finish the Zabo and ended up really liking it. It's not my favorite of the Zabos I've read, but it's still great, so yay! I did manage to enthusiastically read some things, however, I didn't I didn't rev up a new kind of efficacy and enthusiasm as I hoped to do. It just didn't happen. The past few weeks have just been too heavy and busy and weird and it's okay, you know? <laughs> the fact that I am not great at pleasure reading right now really is not a big deal, so we're fine. I finished, finally, after reading it for far too long, uh, Paradise Rot, and really liked it. It's not going to end up one of my favorite books of all time, but I'm really glad I read it and I recommend it. Um, I'll probably do a longer wrap-up at some point in a monthly wrap-up, perhaps, but in effect this is a kind of uncomfortable, uncanny, queer, coming-of-age, um, coming-of-identity, figuring out where you are and where others, where you end and where others start kind of um, situationship story. I previously said that it was very grody and I stick by that. Um, there's a lot of nature imagery, but it's a lot of fermented um, and uh, kind of hyper done imagery, uh, a lot of bodily uh, excrement and function and just bodies being bodies. Um, so that was, it worked. It worked well for me. Uh, I'm glad I read it. Did I have anything else that I wanted to say about it? Oh, I've read a lot of people calling it a fever dream, and I think that's a, a pretty apt description too, so I'll steal that descriptor. Uh, meanwhile, I'm still very much unfinished with this. I like it still. Uh, I just have not picked it up in almost two weeks, so I should get back to it. I wish that I had kicked my slump, found some new enthusiasm and um, vision, but eh, not yet. Maybe it will come in the last two months of the year. I've been tagged in the um, end of the year book tag, which I feel a little overwhelmed about doing because I'm really lacking vision currently, but maybe that'll sort of force me to have a little bit more. Who knows? Anyway, that's my wrap up. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.